my talk this morning is Mapping for Resilience, Turning Data into Decisions. Raise your hand if you have not heard of the U.S. Agency for International Development. Okay, just a couple. That's a good sign. So, as most of you know, USAID, as we call it, is the lead foreign assistance agency for the U.S. government. We work all over the world in about 100 countries. We work to lift people out of poverty, and we work in all kinds of sectors, as we call them. In the, in the academic world, it would be called disciplines. We work to address um, issues of economic growth, of democracy and governance, uh, agriculture and food security, climate change, environmental issues, health, water issues, education, and of course, probably what we're best known for is responding to disasters. But we've got two tracks. Yes, we respond to disasters, but we also focus on long-term international development issues and the nexus between the two. So my center, the Geo Center, is housed in a new entity within USAID called the US Global Development Lab. The lab, as we refer to it, has been in place for about a year. And the focus of the lab is simply to bring to bear the advancements in science, technology, innovation, and partnerships to the development enterprise. And we are trying to integrate what we call STIP, because in the government, we always have to make acronyms for everything. Uh, we apply STIP to help solve some of the world's greatest challenges. So who are we exactly, this geocenter that I keep referring to? Simply put, I would say we are geographers with a passion. We have 15 of us based in Washington, D.C., which is the headquarters of USAID. And our extended global network, we have about 25 geographers in countries in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, the Middle East, and Eastern Europe. So we're growing. That number should be higher even by the end of this year. So at this point, we have more than 40 full-time dedicated specialists with a background in geographic information systems and analysis, focusing on the application of uh, geography for international development. So the photograph you're seeing here is the last gathering that we all had when we came together in October of last year with everyone in Washington. And it's an opportunity for people to share lessons learned, uh, to look up some of their technical skills, of course, and to just get reacquainted with each other for moral support much of the time. So what do we do? As I said, my agency works all over the world. We have quite a large mandate. We really focus on geographic analysis for development programming. Development programming is a bit of a loaded term. What it means to us in the USAID world is applying geographic thought, mapping, analysis to all parts of what we call the program cycle. That means strategic planning. It means program design. It means monitoring our programs in the field. It means evaluating those programs. And it means communicating our results along the way. So that's kind of a big charge. We have multiple ways that we intervene in this program cycle with our colleagues in the field, with our colleagues based in Washington, D.C., who are experts in those sectors that I mentioned. We really want to understand where is the development need concentrated in the countries where we work. And then, of course, the big question that many of us in large organizations want to know is where are we actually working? Easy question, hard to answer. When you're a decentralized, large, bureaucratic agency, it is actually hard to keep up with where you're working and what you're doing and whether or not you're working in the same place with each other. Sometimes tripping over each other, not intentionally, but it can happen. So we like to compare the two. Are we working in the places where the development need is actually the greatest? Many times these, these link up. They don't always. So as a geographer, from my perspective, it's hard for me to understand how is it that USAID has been around for over 50 years without applying ge the geographic approach to everything that we do. 
And in this modern era of information and communication technologies, that is exactly the revolution that I would say my team and I are trying to create from inside of the agency. We're a little bit of a startup inside of a government bureaucracy. Once we compare those two, we also like to understand, are some of our projects more effective in some places versus others? Sometimes we'll have a health project, a response to HIV and AIDS, for example, and the programs that we apply in one part of South Africa uh, may be some of the same programs that we apply in another part of Southern Africa region. Are some working more effectively than others? If so, why or why not? Could there be a geographic component that is having an influence on the, that effectiveness? We also want to make sure we are making the very best use of public funds. We are a US government agency, and the public has entrusted us to make the very best decisions about where we make investments in the developing world. So can we leverage investments? Is the health sector program doing something in the same place, for example, as our agriculture sector dealing with food security? Can we possibly make the very most out of those limited dollars that we have? So using the geographic approach helps us better understand this. And then ultimately, we'd like to know, where are other donors working? Are they also working in the same place? Are they working on the same issues? Do they have a different approach? But unless we look at it through this geographic lens, it's very hard to know until you find out sometimes too late. So I thought I would give you a few examples of the kinds of work that my team has been engaged with. We've been around almost four years, so we're still new to the agency compared to 50 plus years. We're still in the process of demonstrating our value. I can't quite say that we've been in place for 10 years the way that the OSM community has been, but I can tell you that it took nearly 10 years for me to get a new startup idea in place inside of the agency. So we're going through a process of looking at what's working, looking at what isn't working so well, and how do we move forward to demonstrate the value of this geographic information. And one of the things in particular that we're focusing on right now is understanding better the biodiversity threats and the drivers of deforestation in the Amazon region, Peru in particular. So that takes data. That takes an understanding of what's happening on the ground. Yes, we use satellite imagery for this to get a big picture sense of what changes are happening over time, and we map that but we also have to go to the ground. We also have to talk to people there and understand what's driving their behavior, what's driving their decisions. Why are local people doing things that have the impact of actually destroying their local environment? Economically, there are incentives for them. There are gold mines uh, that, that provide opportunities for income that were not there before. So providing geographic information is essential in telling the story at the local, at the national, and at the international level. And it's also essential for USAID in the region to better understand with data and evidence how to and where to invest our programs over the next five years. Some images about what we've been doing in Peru lately, and this will extend beyond Peru to the greater Amazon region. This gives you a sense if you're familiar, of course, with imagery, as we all are, because everybody looks online now to see, if not their house with Google Earth, you're usually mapping with OSM, hopefully, and we're using high-res imagery to see what's going on on the ground. So this is kind of giving a sense. It's pretty shocking when you start zooming in closer and closer to see, and then when you go to the ground and see why local people are engaged in activities because of the economic opportunities that it affords them. There are health repercussions from these activities, however, and that's another way we're using geographic information to get that point across. A project that we just wrapped up last year was a really interesting one in which we collaborated with the Department of Defense, a non-traditional partner for USAID, working with a specific parts of the military Niger is a country in West Africa in the heart of the Sahel. It's one of the poorest countries in the world. And it is critical to the stability of the region. There have been quite a few activities underway in the region. If anybody's heard of Boko Haram or Al-Qaeda, there are activities that are happening in this part of the world that are having an impact on people locally and are affecting their livelihoods. 
So the military was interested in working with USAID because we realized we're both interested in the same places. We just have different ways of operating to address the issues. And the military recognizes that if we on the civilian side can understand some of the vulnerabilities and the challenges and the shocks to people locally and address them at the front end, then perhaps we could avoid dealing with it on the back end when the situation becomes more conflict oriented. And it's not to say that there's a direct causal relationship between vulnerability and extremist behavior, but we do want to be understanding what are some of the challenges to people locally that might be a driver for becoming involved with activities that are, are not so uh, stable for the region. So our work involved a very interesting um, new method. We used publicly available information published by the World Bank, uh, survey, household survey data across the entire country of Niger, very deep information, statistically analyzed it to better understand what kinds of shocks people were subject to at the household level. The things we learned were fascinating. It, we learned that it matters what the gender is of the head of a household and the decisions that get made. We learned that it matters what the age of the head of household and the age of many of the household members are, younger versus older. We learned that it matters what the ethnicity is in the mix of the household in terms of their uh, vulnerability or not. And we learned that it matters who has access to uh, community services. So those of us who have been working in the international development field for years understand these things, but it's not necessarily the kind of questions that the military would be asking. So for us to come together and have an opportunity to collaborate, it was an experience. We, were, we both learned from each other. We have our own acronyms. The Department of Defense has many of its own acronyms. But the mapping part allowed us to have a common operating picture with data that was statistically analyzed that gave us confidence in what we were seeing. And we presented the results to subject matter experts who understood the health challenges, who understood the food security shocks, who understood some of the changes that have been occurring over time in this region in terms of uh, rainfall and access to basic natural resources. And we also were able to create a dialogue that started in the same space. It was a new opportunity and we have, we have discussed how we were going to move forward in the future, but that analytical process is now influencing a new U.S. government policy focused on the Sahel region that was not there before, that will involve what we call a whole of government approach, in which the State Department, the U.S. Agency for National Development, and the Department of Defense and others will collaborate on bringing our talents to bear to address some of these challenges. So that's one of the results of, of the, the maps that you're looking at here in terms of decision making. Everybody remembers, I hope, this was in the news almost every 15 minutes last year about these unaccompanied children who were immigrating to the US um, across the border from Central America. And it was heartbreaking, the stories that we were seeing on television. What on earth does my GeoCenter team have to do with that? That was a domestic issue in the US. Well, it turns out that um, USAID works in the countries where the children were originating. And being able to understand what the drivers were for families to send their children a, on such a treacherous journey uh, to the US for un, unsure results upon arrival, um, it turns out that, well, we need to understand what's causing this in the first place. And so it gave USAID a seat at the table among principals at White House level meetings of the Department of Homeland Security, uh, the Health and Human Services, the big players in our US government who are, who are grappling with how to handle the situation. So our team got involved with mapping and gathering data at the local level to best understand where are the children coming from? How does that compare to poverty levels? How does that compare to where USAID is already working? And we were able to determine some very interesting things. USAID was working in some of the very stressed neighborhoods in the country of Honduras, for example, but we weren't working in all of the parts of the country where the issues were. We also learned that the drivers for children leaving in Honduras were not the same as in Guatemala. In Honduras, it was more based on um, families that could afford to send their children, and we looked at homicide rates. 
and the safety and security. And so families were sending their children because they felt it would be safer where they would end up versus where they were. That's kind of an extreme situation to decide. In Guatemala, it was, an, it was a different reason. It was because of poverty and the economic opportunities that were afforded them by coming to the US. So we have to understand the reasons for the behavior before we can come up with the solutions to address them. Of course, we all remember the Ebola outbreaks. It hasn't ended yet, but it's much better now than it was last August, of course. My team got involved with the response to that as well. Not so much in responding to people on the ground who were ill, but understanding better how to improve the health networks in the country. We take for granted in this country that we can use a cell phone, that we can send information instantly, either to the person in the back of the room in a conference room or someone to the other side of the world. This is a country and this is a part of the world that doesn't have access to information the way we do so quickly. And in our efforts, we really wanted to understand where is the cell coverage, where is it not, and how would we as an agency work with the private sector to invest in improving cell coverage in that country to be able to send information more effectively when it comes to a major illness, a major health outbreak like this. Some of our greatest challenges in the GeoCenter, this will come as no surprise, it's finding the available data that will be relevant to the problem that we're trying to address once it's clearly defined. If any of you have ever been in a situation of, of having a concept that's difficult to define and then trying to find data that could be a proxy measure and then analyzing that data, it's a pretty long process. We get asked internally by our colleagues who don't know this process, hey, can you make me a map for that? <laughs> um, all they see is the map at the end, but there's a lot that goes on behind that map, and there are iterations before the final maps get presented. So we need data, and we need quality data, and we need completeness of that data. It's key to everything that we do in influencing the kinds of decisions that we are in the position to influence. In 2013, we engaged in a very unique partnership at USAID. We partnered with our very close colleagues at the State Department and the Humanitarian Information Unit. We partnered with colleagues in the World Bank. We obviously took advantage of the incredible uh, platform that the OSM community has been able to establish. And we partnered with a local organization just getting formed called Kathmandu Living Labs, made up of many students from the university in Kathmandu and a very dynamic champion who started the organization. And it was in anticipation, frankly, of a possible disaster around an earthquake. We knew that this could occur. This is a seismically active area. We had no idea when it would occur. So we engaged in an experiment, all of us together. And we worked with GW University, based in Washington, DC, George Washington University, and the geography department there, which is very forward-leaning in focusing on open data. And we engaged the students on how to use OSM with high resolution imagery, of course, as the backdrop, and we began to map from afar in Kathmandu. That base data then, of course, was available in OSM, and the students in KLL then validated the data and added the attributes and really went from building to building to understand how many students are in this school. This is a picture of, of uh, us talking to one of the uh, principals of the school validated um, the height of the buildings, the materials they were made of, basics like this. So this information then, who knew, would be available less than two years later when the earthquake hit April tw uh, 25th of this year. And that base data was available and we were able to get that base data downloaded onto GPS units before search and rescue teams left from the US to go to Kathmandu to do what they do best. Imagine going into a place you've never been to before and you're asked to save people's lives. Having a map is critical. And comparing this effort to what we did, we, this is the collective we, because the GeoCenter wasn't in place then, uh, the response to the Haiti earthquake, it's like night and day, being able to have that kind of information available to search and rescue teams. So we've been able to collaborate with the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance and other humanitarian response organizations that are using this information. It's very heartwarming to know that the work we've put in, the room collect, you know, it, people in this room collectively have been able to help out in that way. It's not heartwarming to see the tragedy, but it's heartwarming to know that we can help in our talents that we believe in. So I don't need to tell you more about that because I'm sure everyone here has the earthquake still on their mind because the, re the re response is still underway. 
but this was an opportunity for us through this Open Cities program to decide, all right, how do we in the Geo Center and USAID take advantage of this amazing community of volunteer mappers? How do we take advantage of a platform that's still in the making, but still is usable? And how do we match that supply with a demand that we as a government agency with our mandate to deal with some of the most pressing challenges internationally? How do we make that work? So we're still figuring that out, but we've come up with a program and we're calling it Mapping for Resilience. We're trying to look at the opportunities that having this data available for response to disasters affords, but also for the long-term international development to create more resilient communities. As I mentioned earlier, we need complete data sets foundation data layers for road networks, urban infrastructure, open spaces, land use, non-urban areas for the kinds of things we're doing. And we would love to see in five years, well, less than five years, if I could put a vision out there for this, for this community, I'd love to say let's shoot for creating complete data sets that start and end in an area, but not, start, not end in the middle. A, a road half mapped isn't really gonna be able to help us do the analyses that we need to do. So these photos you're looking at here are literally hot off the press. Just this week, uh, my team was in Bangladesh. We are working on a food security program with our local field office there. And uh, Chad Blevins, if he's here in the audience, uh, okay, raise his hand in the back, is the one who literally just got off a plane from Bangladesh. I don't even think he's had a chance to sleep 12 hours, or been back 12 hours yet. But um, he led an effort with students at Kulna University in southeastern Bangladesh to teach them how to use field papers. Because the students at GW, we've continued that relationship that we started when we were looking at Kathmandu, and we've had them map an area in Bangladesh that is of importance to our USAID field office where the food security programs are being implemented and where they need basic map data to understand where to put the programs. So we've again created this, or we've created this virtual partnership between students in the US and students in the developing world. In our last Mapathon, we engaged with Texas Tech University and we also have Patricia Solis here from Texas Tech representing. We're creating a new partnership here. We're trying to empower the young people of the world to map their world, to have a voice in what their world looks like and to put their communities actually on the map. And by doing this, we're also creating data that our own agency can make use of for making better informed decisions about international development challenges. So moving forward, we envision a partnership going forward that's unusual for us. We want to map the areas of greatest need, of course. We want to empower local communities. We want to create, we're creating a university consortium, a core group of universities who will be engaged in this mapping for resilience effort. So stay tuned for what is to come on that. But we're very excited about creating youth-led mapping chapters on campuses around the world. Because together, that's how we will ultimately map our world. So we'd like to take OSM to the next level within our own agency as well as the community as a whole. And I'd like to open this up now for, for your questions on how we might do that. We've learned a few things in the Geo Center. We've learned when you start up a new idea within a government bureaucracy and you ask people to take on something they've never done before, you have to earn their trust in the process. Technology is essential, but trust is even more important because people won't try something new if they've got fear that it isn't really gonna work and they're gonna invest something in it. We've also learned that we have to understand the needs of our audience. To just put something together that might be cool and look sexy doesn't mean it's gonna actually result in solving a problem or creating a solution or uh, helping a decision get made more effectively. So we've had to learn these lessons ourselves in demonstrating our own value. But we believe that working and partnering with OSM and your community, this community that will help us take our abilities in the Geo Center to the very next level. So I'd like to end by starting a joke or starting a, a little story and have you help me end it. What happens when a bureaucrat, an academic, and a hacker walk into a bar? What can we map in this world? Thanks.
Okay. Hi. Um, yeah, very quickly, my name is Julio. Um, from, I'm representing Costa Rica here, and we're working on climate change uh, resilience projects. And uh, I'm here because that word resilience brought me to this room. And uh, I'd like to know if uh, in your projects you have uh, used that word in a broader sense rather than just humanitarian work as opposed to resilience to climate change and other challenges and threats that, uh, that we're working on as well. Thank you. Hello. Yeah. Okay. So um, I would say it's 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 uh, resilience is a very general term, and we are using it in the international development field in so many different ways. There are definitions. In AID, we have a whole uh, community focused on resilience to climate change impacts, to global change impacts, to all kinds of different changes over time, and how do we create more resilient communities? So. In our work, we are saying we would like to be able to apply the geographic approach to this effort looking at resilience, all the different kinds. My particular background happens to be in climate change, so my heart is, my foot's in the climate change door. Um, but yes, it is to actually create geographic information, but not just create the data. Actually, we need to analyze this data, and we have to combine it with other kinds of data. It's not just the foundation layers, but what my team, what we realized when we got into this analytical process was, okay, we just need the basics here. We can't even get to the higher order analysis unless we've got some of the basics. And it never occurred to me that I would be in the business of creating that data. But when we realized we didn't have it, we didn't want to wait around for somebody else to do it. We said, all right, how can we do this? Who are the communities that are already doing this? Who are the passionate ones that we can link up with? and go forward together. Hello? Okay. So you, you talked about that people want to try something new, but you need to give them the trust. So what are the, some of the examples that you did specifically for your group to uh, create that trust, like products or technology process? Can you talk about a couple examples? Excellent question. Very good question. I'll tell you the first thing. We listened. We just asked them what they needed and we listened. It doesn't mean that we promised we were, could, we could deliver it. We just listened to them. This is a hard thing to do. When you think you have the solution to something and you've got this sexy new tech tool, it's all of us want to go and throw it down and say, here's the answer to your, all your problems. And we had to step back and say, mm, keep the mouth closed, ask one or two questions, and listen. We, ask, we, we do needs assessments. And we hear the words they use. We understand what their issues are. Because they don't come to us and say, we're trying to solve this climate change issue, and we have this data set and that data set and this time series, and this is the, what we want the final product to look, and oh, we're going to give you a week to do it. They never come to us with the data. They never come to us with the, all the steps we have to go through to actually get a product and that will make sense. And of course, they still ask for it in a week. <laughs> so I would say we listened. Uh, we also, we, we invested the time to understand what they were ultimately trying to do. What kind of decisions did they need to make? Sometimes they'll tell you a decision, but it's not that first decision that they're talking about. There's a second or third order level decision. And we had to observe that before we could find the best way to kind of intervene. So the trust building, I think, has come over time. And it took a long time to just, I, I hate to admit this, but I think I was an internal cheerleader for many years about why maps matter before I actually could make a map. And that took me shifting my expectation of myself because I went in thinking, oh, I'm all high tech here and I got the science background and I'm gonna save the world from the climate changing. And I'll be honest with you, when I started, people didn't even know how to use Excel and attach it to an email. And I was talking about photogrammetry and uh, geographic information system software that people had never quite heard of at the time. This is a while back, so I'm dating myself telling you how long I've been at USAID, but a lot had to happen internally to gain the trust. They kept saying, why does that girl keep talking about satellites? What does it have to do with a woman who's 
plowing her field with a baby on, the ba on her back in Africa. What is the link? And making that link and gaining that credibility before I could come in and then slap down the high tech tools that were really gonna help. So that was part of the process we went through. Okay, sure. Still trying to get technology to work here in terms of communication, so. All right. Hi. Uh, nice presentation. So I'm Asan from Bangladesh. So <laughs> uh, last week, actually, I was talking with Chad. And then we, we were discussing about that, uh, the sustainability of these OSM projects actually we're doing. So uh, can you go the, uh, back one slide? Yep. Uh, no, next one. This one? Yeah. Yep. Uh, there is the important local communities to map their world and the university consortium. So actually, I was uh, talking about the uh, sustainability, actually. Do you think that in your project that uh, it should not be like that the project is finished, that everything finished? The, what you are thinking about the sustainability of, that, uh, of, of this initiative, your great initiative? Sure, I love that question because the key word here is sustainability. We're all about making sure that what we do has a lasting impact. And there's no secret sauce for that. There are some key things we've learned along the way, but what works in one place doesn't necessarily work in the other place, but we're trying to learn. So the answer is, I absolutely want this to be more than just one one-off fun mapping event with students in the field. We absolutely want to figure out a way to empower this to be more than just even the 25 students we were working with in this last week, but to have students across your country actually doing this and feeling empowered to do it. I wanna give you a little information that, that, that I didn't mention earlier. Talk about passion. These students that were mapping their community don't even have access to the internet on campus. They were out there with field papers and they collected this information and then they use mobile uh, Wi-Fi connectors that our USA admission provided to be able to upload this information. This work that we're all doing here is new, it's creative, and it takes passion to oversee every obstacle along the way, whether it's a technology obstacle, whether it feels like it might be a funding obstacle, whether it's just an obstacle because people say no and they can't understand the vision you have in your head. It takes time, but look at where this community is in 10 years. Yeah. Look, and I can't sit here and say I've got all the answers with my team, but we're in existence now and nobody believed we could do it 10 years ago. So, I am all about trying to figure out creative ways to make sure we can ensure that this is sustainable. I don't have all the answers quite yet. I'd love to follow up with you and get some of your creative thoughts on how we yeah. can make that happen. So, so it's a big, very big platform. So would you allow me to suggest three things for, for the sustainability? Absolutely, suggest oh, away. Okay. So from my experience, I found that uh, yeah, technology is an obstacle, but uh, if we want, then we can uh, uh, come up with that. That's not a problem. One is that, uh, uh, what we have to do, that is the collaboration. Different organization is working with the same thing, mm -hmm. but there is no collaboration. This is one thing. Mm -hmm. And second is that uh, there should be a policy advocacy, so that uh, if it is in the government system, if you come uh, bring it in, uh, under government policy somehow, then it, it, it will last for long. And third is they uh, try to bring this thing in the academic curriculum. Uh, so the students, at least the students who are actually uh, uh, studying environmental management and then geography, so if we can bring this type of technology in the curriculum somehow, and then it will, it will last long, actually, I, I believe. Thank you. Great suggestions. I'd love to follow up with you further, because what we learn in one place, we want to be able to take that learning and apply it to the next place. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So with that, I think we're absolutely out of time, and I would like to hand this over to our next speaker. But one last very geeky thing that I can do as a girl, I can't wear a tie up here, but I do have a skirt that you probably can't see, so I'll stand out here. I've got to just show this off. This is what a mapped world looks like. <laughs> and you too can order a skirt or a tie with OSM data. So this is the vision I would like to see in five years. Can we map the world together? <laughs>